So, what is today's problem? This. This is. The symbol on the left seems to represent an infinite sum. But I've never seen the symbol on the right. Cindamon, have you already forgotten? Meden, why are you here? Well then, let's go step by step. For now, we will consider the finite case. Do you understand the meaning of this symbol? Ah, let's assume each AK is a real number. I know at least that much. Here, K ranges from 1 to N. So it means adding A1 to AN. Well done. Now, about this symbol written as a capital Chi. This is the multiplication version of Sigma. Multiplication version of Sigma. Which means, here too, K ranges from 1 to N. So, it means multiplying A1 by A2 all the way to AN, right? Exactly. It's a bit less common than sigma, but it's used sometimes, so remember it. Got it. Now that I've explained the finite case of sums and products, let's move on to the infinite case. First, a simple explanation, this symbol represents an infinite sum. Hmm, I see. It ranges from 1 to infinity. So that means the sum a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus and so on continues infinitely. Exactly. So, what about this other expression? Ah. This symbol is the multiplication version of sigma, so. It means multiplying a1, a2, a3, and so on infinitely, right? Yes, that's the right idea. But what exactly does it mean for multiplication to continue infinitely? Hmm, we need to define that properly. That was an intuitive explanation, so let's move on to a rigorous definition. First, an infinite sum is defined as the sum up to the nth term, with n approaching infinity. Oh, I see. Indeed, this way we can properly define an infinite sum using a limit. Next, an infinite product is. I already got it. An infinite product is defined as the product up to the nth term, with n approaching infinity. You beat me to it. Well, we've now defined an infinite product using a limit. To simplify things, let's assume each AK is non-zero, and we'll exclude cases where this limit converges to zero. Hmm, I'm not sure why, but got it. Now, if we assume AN is causative for all N, there's actually a relationship between infinite sums and infinite products like this. For now, let's take log to mean the natural logarithm. And this notation indicates that the convergence of the left-hand side is equivalent to that of the right-hand side. I'm using this simplified notation just for this video, so keep that in mind. Hmm, so... If the infinite sum converges, then the infinite product converges too. And conversely, if the infinite product converges, the infinite sum also converges, right? That's exactly it. Sundamon, do you think you can prove it? I'll give it a shot. First, this log part seems suspicious. Log has the property of turning products into sums, but... Is it okay to apply log to an infinite product? That's definitely something we need to think through carefully. For now, why don't you try taking the log of the partial product? I'll do just that. Let's consider the partial product up to the nth term. And then apply the log to it. Since log turns products into sums, it looks like this. Now, when we take n to infinity on both sides, if we assume the product here converges, then this sum here will also converge. In other words, if the infinite product in the problem converges, then the infinite sum also converges. By the way, since we're excluding cases where the infinite product converges to zero, we know that even as n approaches infinity, the argument inside the log won't go to zero. That. That's true. Log zero isn't even defined. Next, similarly, when the infinite sum converges, the infinite product also converges. Does that wrap up the proof? Well, that's mostly correct, but... To be thorough, it's better to take the exponential of both sides. By the way, exponential x means e to the x. Doing so, the left-hand side becomes just the partial product. And the right-hand side looks like this. Therefore, when n tends to infinity, if the right-hand side's partial sum converges, then the left-hand side's partial product will also converge. And since we're taking exponential, it's clear the value won't be zero. So we can also see that zero is excluded as a convergence point for the infinite product. Ah, well, I mean, I totally knew that. Still, today's problem was pretty easy. Watch out. Something's coming. What?
Whoa! This... this is... This is the true form of today's problem. What do you mean? If we assume each a n is non-negative, then we need to prove that the condition of the infinite sum of a n converging is equivalent to the condition of the infinite product of 1 plus a n converging. This time there's no log involved. It's a rather mysterious statement. By the way, wasn't this notation something you came up with, Metin? Don't sweat the small stuff. But still, considering the infinite product of 1 plus a n is kind of strange, where did this one even come from? It's not that strange for one to show up here. Ha! Huh? Why? When the infinite sum of a n converges, a n converges to zero as n tends to infinity, right? Oh yeah, I remember that. Well, if adding up each term brings the sum closer to a certain value, the impact of each term must gradually become smaller. In other words, the values being added must approach zero. That's intuitively convincing. That seems reasonable for summation. Then, when the infinite product of a n converges, what does a n converge to as n tends to infinity? Eh. If multiplying the terms together gets closer to a certain value, the impact of each term should gradually diminish. So, the values being multiplied must approach 1, right? That's correct. Just to be thorough, let me prove it. Let pn be the partial product up to the nth term. And define p as the limit of pn as n tends to infinity. Assume p is non-zero. Then, a n can be expressed as follows. First, consider the partial product from a1 to a n. And divided by the partial product from a1 to a n minus 1. That leaves only a n, right? This can be expressed as p n over p n minus 1. So as n tends to infinity, the limit is p over p equals 1. Thus, if the infinite product of a n converges, a n itself converges to 1. Wow! I see. When the infinite product of a n converges, a n converges to 1. So when the infinite product of 1 plus a n converges, a n must converge to 0. In this way, we get the same condition as when an infinite sum converges, making it easier to consider. Is that what you're getting at? I think that's exactly it. So now we know where this one comes from? But how do we prove that the convergence of the two limits is equivalent? This is a tricky part, but a common approach is. First, instead of thinking about the limits, let's consider the partial sum and the partial product up to the nth term. Since each ak is non-negative, both are monotonically increasing as n increases. The sum is definitely monotonically increasing, I can see that. The product is also monotonically increasing since you're multiplying values greater than or equal to 1. At this point, the condition for convergence as n tends to infinity is equivalent to the condition of being bounded from above, meaning it doesn't exceed a certain value. Hmm, so in other words, if it's not decreasing and doesn't exceed a certain value, then it must converge somewhere, right? That's the correct understanding. Technically, this is related to the continuity of real numbers, but let's set that aside for now. Got it. Now, instead of proving that if one converges, the other must also converge, we can just prove that if one is bounded from above, the other is also bounded from above. Let's start by proving this inequality. If we can prove this, then we can show that if the product is bounded, the sum is also bounded. I've never seen an inequality like this before. Well, let's give it a try. If we write out the product according to the definition, it looks something like this. Now, all that's left is to show that this is greater than the sum, but... How should we do that? Hmm... Ah! I got it! If you imagine expanding this product... First, you pick A1, and then pick 1s for the rest. And you'll get A1. Similarly, if you pick A2 and 1s for the rest, you'll get A2. You just keep doing that. Of course, when you expand the product, you'll get a bunch of other terms. So this inequality holds. Especially, if you pick 1s for all terms, you'll get 1. So you can see that equality does not hold here. Brilliant, Zundemon. With this, we've proven that if the product is bounded, the sum is also bounded. That was easy. Now, can you prove it the other way around? Huh? The other way? Next, we need to show that if the sum is bounded, the product is also bounded. But even if you say that, we've already proved that this inequality holds, so we can't prove it in the opposite direction, right? It does seem pretty difficult, I agree. 
Oh, watch out, a hint is coming. What? Whoa, this, this is. Looks like this is the hint. How on earth are we supposed to use this? Look closely, Zundemon. Doesn't this part look familiar? Huh, now that you mention it. One plus X in this hint. It's the same form as the terms in the product. So, if this hint is correct, applying the hint gives us this inequality. Then, if we use the exponent rules, we can express the product with a sum, right? So this means, if the sum is bounded from above, it proves that the product is also bounded from above. You really suck today, Zundemon. But how do we prove this inequality of the hint? Leave that part to me. This is known as the McCorn series of e to the x, which expresses e to the x as a certain kind of infinite sum. In particular, we're considering x to be non-negative now. So if we truncate the infinite sum at this part, we get the inequality of the hint. Ah, I see. That said, it might seem a bit abrupt. So let's think about it a bit more intuitively. In the graph of y equals e to the x, the tangent line at this point is y equals 1 plus x. And as you can see from this diagram, this inequality always holds. Oh, so that's what this inequality means. With this, it definitely seems like it should hold. You can rigorously prove it by evaluating the difference in the values of the two functions. But let's skip that part for now. Okay, with this, we've proven the equivalence mentioned in the problem. Who would have thought about such a relationship between infinite sums and infinite products? It's really surprising. When considering convergence, you can choose the easier one to work with. By the way, we assume that an is non-negative this time. But let's briefly talk about the general case. For an infinite product in this form, let's consider the infinite product where we replace an with its absolute value. Then, we say that the original infinite product absolutely converges. If this modified infinite product converges... Hmm, I see. That's kind of an unusual definition. Why do we need to think about it this way? Good question. Let me explain. In the relationship between infinite sums and infinite products we just proved, if we remove the condition that an is non-negative and instead consider its absolute value, since absolute values are non-negative, this relationship we've proven still holds. Hmm, that's true. Now, when the infinite sum of the absolute values converges, the original form of the infinite sum also converges. I remember now. In infinite sums, absolute convergence is a stronger condition than regular convergence. Exactly. And actually, the same is true for infinite products. If an infinite product converges absolutely, it's known to converge in the regular sense as well. Oh, really? In that case, thinking about absolute convergence for infinite products feels quite natural. However, as a point of caution, there's no equivalence in terms of convergence between infinite sums and infinite products in general cases. If we don't have the condition that an is non-negative, it is known that the convergence of one is neither a necessary nor sufficient condition for the convergence of the other. That does feel a bit disappointing, but, on the flip side, it makes the concept of absolute convergence feel even more important. This time we dealt with general theory, but examples of infinite products might show up as problems in the future. I'm getting excited. Well then, take care everyone. See you next time.